Hello Tabletop Wargamers, and welcome to Tried and True, a podcast hosted by the Delaware War Machine community. Join us as we dive deep into topics around our favorite games, exploring methods and techniques proven to enhance anyone's gaming experience. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 16th episode of Tried and True. I am your host, Paul. And I'm Erica. It feels really good to be back after Dan and you having your your own episodes. It's it's nice. I, I really enjoyed your episode with Miranda. It was it was really it was a really fun listen. Yeah, she's she's a lot of fun. I feel like if we lived closer together, we would we really hit it off. I think yeah, we would probably probably game together yeah she's a cool chick i had a I had a lot of fun talking with her i love it so we want to go ahead and thank more than dice for giving us another platform for being able to share the great news gonzo is great he's been super helpful and all the other podcasts minority report they have the new warcaster one that uh just came out we had the boker broadcast i mean those guys are hilarious just lots and lots of good stuff Oh, sorry, like really quick too. Shout out to Advanced Maneuvers. Those guys run a great podcast and channel as well. And they were a big help to not just our team individually during Nova, but for the like war uh, machine event in itself. So check those guys out. They are they are awesome. Absolutely. If you like what you're listening to, please make sure you take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have those battle reports coming. We've got a couple more down the line with Halloween around the corner. We have some spooky battle reports that we're looking forward to, so we're excited to have them out. And if you're interested in supporting the cause, uh, definitely look us up on Patreon. Your support definitely helps us out in our efforts to be able to create more content. So, uh, Erica, I think with just Nova and stuff, I think we should actually kind of do a little bit of like a summary of what has happened. So, you and I and and Andy and Dan, we all went down to Nova. So uh, what was your experience? Was it the first time? It was the first time you were there, right? Yeah, it was my first time. Um, it was my first, like, legitimate, long uh, wargaming convention. Man, playing like that, that is the young man's game. Uh, <laughs> that um, <laughs> was a lot of endurance because it was literally, like, playing chess for 12 hours a day. It was, what, like, 10 uh, games or something like that? I played 12 in Ugh. three days. Yeah, no, it was good. Uh, so, uh, quick sidebar, our team, we ended up uh, losing a member last minute. And then shout out to Eric, if he's listening. It was like, you know, at the end of Space Jam, when Bill Murray shows up, <laughs> like, when they're down a team and, like, saves the day. Like, we had our Bill Murray moment with Eric. So, thanks for uh, thanks for stepping in and playing on our team. Yeah, it was great. He had his trolls. He had Azazello out there. It was just great. And it was just a nice time. Like we we had a really fun time with it. If anyone's ever like worried about going to these events because of like the players and you're worried about, you know, maybe like skill level differences and stuff like that. Every single person that I interacted with in the War Machine table area was like super cool, regardless if they were a WTC player or somebody that plays nationally or somebody new that's coming back to the game. Everybody was so friendly. And even if I was playing an army I wasn't familiar with and I figured probably not going to have a, a very positive outcome for myself. I took it as like a learning opportunity and went into the game like that. And yeah, so shout out to, you know, all those all those folks that were out there and good luck to the WTC team USA. Yeah, I'm really excited to see how they end up doing with that. And I agree. Go to those conventions. You have the opportunity to go and do them. Go with a friend if you want to. But I'm telling you, if you go and hang out with the War Machine players, everybody just loves to play the game. They love to talk about the game. You'll be among friends, I promise. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to go share the interesting news that, I guess, the proposition that you got? Yes. So while at uh, attending the War Machine events, I was approached by the individual who's been running the War Machine uh, events there for probably the better part of a, a decade, a guy, a guy named Jonathan. He really doesn't play anymore. Approached me kind of in between rounds and was like, hey, you know, I heard Delaware War Machine. You guys are really you know, kind of getting around, running stuff in the community. Like we got the sussy scuff going on this weekend. I'm kind of, I'm looking to pass the baton, so to speak. So we were offered the opportunity to actually manage and run the War Machine events for Nova 2023. It's... So I think uh, Delaware War Machine is as going back to dc <laughs> it's it's really exciting I, I i was excited to hear about that i ended up leaving early i didn't stay for the masters event erica like texted me on discord like that night said hey we might be running this and i'm like what but it, that's exciting it's really cool and, and and that's great and i'm happy to be able to have those opportunities to be able to you know share this game and give 
uh, uh, people, you know, a good experience. Maybe we can try to get those, uh, you know, tables like Lord of the Rings tables, huh? Yeah, yeah. Those uh, those Lord of the Rings tables are, we, we did a quick like music video, but if you get the opportunity to look at the pictures, those guys are super passionate and very in tune with their craft. Like each table is its own diorama. And in my head, like my head canon was every day the convention continued, the tables would get more elaborate. Like day two, they have weather effects and smoke machines. Day three, they're like blaring the movie soundtrack in the background. But apparently Nova, like that's the world premiere event for Lord of the Rings. Beautiful tables, like they're gorgeous. Mwah, chef's kiss. Absolutely. I was talking to the guy who ended up like basically organizing the tables for the past six years. And he said it's, it, it's, it's not a one event thing he's been piecemealing it you know every single year and just getting the tables that much more and more and more elaborate it was it was great but uh i guess right now but i mean the next convention we have to go look forward to is boca brawl so you ready to do one more team event getting into the end of the year yes i am ready <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking forward to hang out with seth and everybody for that it's gonna be a good time I'm looking forward to that 24 mm -hmm. hours of war gaming you're gonna do it uh, no, uh, <laughs> 12 hours is about my, uh, my max for War Machine before I need to seek food and water. I hear that. I hear that. And then I guess the last thing is the Primecast 7. Did you end up following that? Yeah, I listened to it. It was, it was good to hear, um, you know, the, some of the changes and stuff coming out to, uh, with War Machine. Yeah, I, I'm really excited to see what Dusk ends up looking like. I, I, I like the word sleek, sleek and evil. I'm really excited by that. But I, I think that's enough, you know, uh, smoking around. We actually have a guest on today and it is a returning guest second time he's on the show we have matt gets again hey how's everybody doing <laughs> it's it's so exciting to have you again uh, for a second time you know because of the first time we had you for the nightmare empires kickstarter and then you know as soon as i was finishing up with the private tier press interviews I got the call it's like hey do you want to do a couple more and i'm like well i i know one thing that i would really really like to do is, is to talk about lore and what's going on in the mark four but before we even get to that matt can you share with what's going on or anything that you can talk about with what's happening with the iron kingdoms rpg right now yeah we just recently dropped the stormsmith class which is a uh, archetype for the mechanic and it allows you to zap people with lightning from great distances we've got some more stuff coming up at the end of this month in sort of our signar block and i'm really excited for what we're doing next month we had that uh tell us about your character contest and the winner is going to have some content field uh very likely at the end of october right around time for halloween so erica right now is currently running shadow the seeker so erica do you want to kind of talk about what's happening within the campaign right now or at least what the party makeup is as soon as you told me about i, I think it's jack's character i just i laughed i thought it was hilarious yeah, um, so our party is a little unorthodox. We're uh, very close to the end of chapter one. We have Kidoran, uh, we have a Lelise, we have a protector at a Menoth individual, we have a pygmy troll, a pharaoh wizard, and a Tharn. That is our party. <laughs> that, that is an eclectic party. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you're near the end of the uh, Yearless Child then? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Like no breaks on this RPG train. So DM Erica, you know, we move, we we move, we move right along. So for the Tharn, when Jack was like, "Hey, this is the this is the class I want to play, the race I want to play. How do I do this without getting killed on site?" And I was like, mm. "All right, let me noodle on this for a sec." So what we did for Jack was I came up with a concept where during the invasion, his character was kidnapped by a bunch of Grey Lords. And they created this uh, collar on him that kind of, while well, he's collared, he's unable to tap into like his more primal urges and powers. It kind of like suppresses that. So he gains bonuses to, you know, conversing with other characters, like his role playing, you know, version. Um, he's, he doesn't look as scary. He's not as intimidating and all that. But again, he doesn't, he loses out on some combat benefits. When he takes his collar off, he gains all those benefits back, you know, no no limit or anything like that. But he has a counter that goes on his character. Starts at 10, difficulty rating 10. For every round of combat he completes, that difficulty rating goes up by a point. So at the end of combat, Jack has to roll a constitution saving throw to consciously apply the collar back on. If he fails, he's basically like, no, this feels too good to tap into this wild <laughs> energy. I refuse to take the collar off. The party has to figure out how to get the collar back on Jack. Um, so we named the uh, collar Mir, which is, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, which is peace in Russian. So that's how that's how we get Jack out in public. And it's been a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> and last little sidebar, Pete, who's playing our Pharaoh, 
one of his big character desires is to be more like cultured. Like when he goes to rent a room for the party, he doesn't realize it's not appropriate to have everybody in the same room. So for him, the collar, he sees that as, oh, that'll make me more like people. So he has a vested interest in acquiring Mir for his own piggy desires. Oh, good. <laughs> that's that's actually a really uh, uh, clever way of implementing some of those unorthodox uh, character groupings in, oh, in yeah. a party. Uh, Thank you. And, and it's totally in keeping with the, the kind of nonsense that Grey Lords would get up to, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was it was just a lot of fun. And when I sent it to Jack, he was just like all over it. And everybody's having a lot of fun with it. Because I don't want to, um, as someone that, that's running a campaign, I never want to put my players in a in a situation where they can't play what they want to. I, I really try and work with my players and to kind of figure out a happy medium for everybody. That's fantastic. Um, it's fun. Yeah, so... Yeah. Good times. So how are you guys uh, <laughs> enjoying the adventure so far? We really like it. The little, what are they? Not like vignettes, but like the feral geist with the, uh, with the elk carcass. Everybody thought that was really cool when they're like, oh, why is this elk walking around dead and, and all this stuff? And we're like, well, it's a feral geist at the end of it. And it's like little stuff like that, like little key tidbits of lore that's sprinkled in the overall story is a lot of fun. I think the party is finally understanding the whole Avros like kid thing, like what's going on with him. So it's been fun kind of seeing the light go, you know, mm. and and then light up. Like it's actually been a really it's it's really well paced. If for anybody that's looking for a campaign, Seekers has been really, really well paced. Again, I'm only in the first chapter, but uh it's been a blast. So kudos. Yeah, it's good times. Um Speaking about the uh, the feral guys kind of set dressing, it's one thing that I always really like to do when I'm having like random encounter tables or something. I don't want every single one of those to be like, oh, here's a different thing that you can fight, right? Sometimes I would prefer that it instead gives people some some interesting bit of information about the world that they happen upon during their journey. I yeah, and it's, it's clever. Oh, sorry, I was going to say it's clever and it's organic. Like, it doesn't feel like these little tidbit things that are, like, sprinkled in this story. It, it feels organic and not that it's, like, thrown in there because it's, like, you're checking a box or something like that. Like, a narrative box, so to speak. It feels organic, but I mean, it's just hearing about it because I just only heard about the Feral Guys. And I, I always go back to how it works in the game, right? I think it's that when a beast dies... It, it takes it over the damage boxes go back up and you, you basically get to control over it i just think it's really interesting how you're able to find a game mechanic and, and be able to naturally put it in a location where i guess it just makes sense yeah matt i'm like really enjoying your story by the way <laughs> oh, thank you it, i've been wanting to make around in ios for a long long time so it mm -hmm. was great to have the opportunity. Well, it's good for me, too, because I don't really know um, a lot about that. Looks, I'm like, Ugh, elves, but um, I guess I'm going to learn them now. But um, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I'm having fun. When, when it comes to things like translating stuff that mostly had its origin in the tabletop war game, like the Feral Geist, it's similar to the Wild Geist from the old D20 books, but it does its own different thing. It's always fun to try and translate out those abilities to the RPG and figure out ways to use them that go beyond the scope of what you see in the war game. Like, you know, there, there aren't going to be a lot of dead elk in a game of hordes, but knowing that it's creatures that this thing takes over, that it has the ability to walk around with their carcasses and just drop that in as a part of what's going on in the world around you is really fun for me. 100%. No, I like it. And then, Matt, one more thing I wanted to ask, because the Nightmare Empire's Kickstarter, that's the last thing that we had you on for. Do you feel comfortable? Can you, like, share, like, how you guys are doing with it? Like, I guess you already got the... Oh, yeah. So it's kind of funny that the first time I was on the podcast, we were leading into the Nightmare Empire Kickstarter, because this time, we're, like, two days out from sending files to the printers. We're, we're doing the last looks and polish and, you know, adjusting the kerning on things and making sure that the orphans and widows are taken care of, uh, moving art around to place it where it's closest and most appropriate to be stuff like that no that's great I'm, I'm really happy to hear that and you know i'm looking forward to being able to see that on the table and i don't know i guess when erica's done with shadow the seeker and get the opportunity to do the nightmare empire maybe you'd be able to run that i would definitely like to play as a pirate i think it'd be that they'd be a good time you could not only play as a pirate you can play as a ghost pirate man yes won it yes please thank you and the adventure book that's with Nightmare Empire differs a little bit from what we've done in the past. Rather than a single overarching story, it's actually four shorter ones that are each developed for 
a different tier of play. You know, you've got your first through fifth level adventure, you've got your sixth through eleventh level adventure. But what you can do is take that and sort of go through the entire lifetime of a character. Uh, you just need to, you know, kind of fill in between the adventures with little side quests and things that players are naturally going to go off and do on their own anyway. So if you get in on that, you might have the opportunity to take your pirate character from the cradle to the grave and because it's critics past the grave you know well i i definitely know what i want to go do now <laughs> well i have to ask you then because i guess this is getting into the segue where we wanted to chat about this episode the mark IV announcement came out and this is huge like just everything is happening the orgoth is is happening i i just i just i i want to ask this before we even get started it has it, because like Mark IV is now here, is that ramping up what is capable in the Iron Kingdoms RPG? Definitely. Like when we see things that like the direction the Storm Legion is going with the fact that Signar has its new model army with this advanced technology in the Stormsmith DLC that we just released, I actually dropped some information about Caitlin Finch as being somebody who sort of stepped into the void left behind when Nemo disappeared and how she had a hand in developing some of the technology that went into the new Storm Legion. It's interesting because while we're developing things at the same time, like they are five years in setting ahead of where I am. So what I'm trying to do with some of the material is sort of show those natural paths to end up where we are in Mark IV. Like, speaking of the Shadow of the Seeker, that was kind of laying inroads and groundwork for the dusk faction that's coming out yeah absolutely definitely getting that vibe from <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's absolutely wonderful and i guess like because i i wanted to ask this like has the time jump been super helpful in making content it like i i guess what are the challenges and the benefits of having the time jump because it's like okay there's like five years that we can play with anything but it's like here's the start point here's the end point how do we fill that gap naturally, as you said? It's certainly presented challenges and opportunities, right? Like, instead of being able to look back at what had already been said, like with the previous edition, there's a little bit more blue sky. And because of that, there are a lot more in-depth conversations with the other members of the development team and the creative teams. Uh, Matt Wilson and Jason Souls in particular, I have to have conversations with them about like, okay, this particular subgroup or this particular culture, here's where I want to be going with them. I need to make sure that lines up with what you're hoping to do with these groups later as well. So there's a lot more back and forth there, but the time jump gives an expansive gulf that we can start to fill with the, the stories and adventures and stuff like that, that I find terrifying and really exciting. Is it like, is it terrifying because it's there's the time constraint of like the five years or... or I, I get... a, a little bit. It's also just the, the vastness of it, you know, like trying to figure out precisely how we're going to get to the point where we see things like, you know, the, the Kador of the new Winter Core is a little bit more like ragged and haggard than the Kato we're used to. So making sure that I'm I'm not putting in any hurdles between you know, the, the story as it is in the RPG and where it will be in Mark IV. Gotcha. So like if they've already released like models, it's that you have to make sure that you're within that boundary of like, this may be a compelling story, but it doesn't fit the theme of how they look right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, making sure that there's a, a continuity of vision between all the different working parts of the company, not not just within one game, but as it interfaces with and connects with other games. Sure, of course. And I mean, it goes back to that conversation that we had during the first interview. It's like, like you sit around the table, you have those meetings, like what's going to work, what won't work, and, and you go forward from there. Exactly. Uh, so, Matt, are there any specific factions or cultures you can't wait to share and talk about? If so, can you explain what makes them so compelling? Oh, man. Yes. So we're beginning pre-production on our next release for the RPG, mm -hmm. and it is going to give us the opportunity to look at some civilizations that we haven't deeply touched on yet. For instance, the Gatormen, the Blindwater Congregation, as society is something that's like it's super cool we've got this this culture of walking talking alligators but there's also some really big story implications for them because at the end of mark three 
Barnabas ascended to demigodhood, essentially. And then it goes from, okay, their entire agenda was building up to that moment. And now that they've achieved it, they're, the dog that caught the car, what do they do with it? <laughs> so mm -hmm. sitting down and thinking like, what if Barnabas decides that being a god is not enough? What if he decides he wants to be like the god instead of just being living avatar of Kosk, which people argue might just be an aspect of the Devourer Worm? What if, what if he wants to be the one and only? So in my notes for kind of the, the pitch document of things that I've sent over to Matt and Jason, I have a line that's just, Barnabas, colon, wants to eat God. <laughs> and, and there's other similar things with some of the other cultures that are going to be in this this next book, looking at like the Thornfall Alliance and Arcadia, or not Arcadia, pardon me, uh, at uh, Carver, and trying to figure out like, where would Carver want to take the Alliance next? Mm -hmm. And there's this image of him, his, his Warcaster art of him sitting on a throne like Conan with a giant cleaver and it really started to make me think of like well what if he's moving on from army building and he's now in the nation building business where would <laughs> that be what would that look like what kinds of things can we do with that so it's it's all of these experimental thoughts uh putting them into documents and then sharing them with the other people on the teams and seeing like from those initial concepts where do we shake out what what sticks around and what doesn't and we're in the process of finding out of that right now. It's fascinating. Matt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so so the, uh, the new War Machine app is hinted at having lore stories. What kind of stories can we expect to see? I mean, hopefully good ones. Um, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so if you're familiar with the fiction that was done for the website on some of the models that came out between book releases or the kinds of stories that went into the No Quarter magazines. I yeah. think we're looking at stuff like that. You know, that's that's awesome. Like, uh, so when Miranda and I were uh, talking in our interview, we were talking about like when a Warcaster went epic. The story mm -hmm. that went along with that was just so how cool that was yeah. back in you know ye early days. So that that's that's really cool to hear. That's exciting. I'm also like I'm a sucker for the the characters that are not necessarily the, the big glowing gods of the setting. You know, like the mm -hmm. the warcasters and warlocks already have a lot of story intrinsic to them. But mm -hmm. some of my favorite ones to write have been about characters like Elias Gade, the Knight Errant, or the Hand of Silence, or you know, just Sofia Skorovna was one that I really liked. Mm -hmm. The characters that you know they have character they have some backstory to them but they're not as heavily focused on a lot of the time and i i just personally really prefer those smaller scale heroes you know yeah no totally hey matt so i wanted to ask aaron rudell mentioned that the recent cator warcaster uh capitan alari boris boris yuck it's just eric it's just boris i was just gonna say boris capitan type <laughs> So it, he he ended up like putting a tweet out that he wasn't ready for the Orgoth invasion a couple months back, and I saw another tweet in August. Do you think is that story going to be in the War Machine app? Do you I, mean, I don't know for certain, but it seems like a fairly likely place for that to to wind up. It it could be that it's coming out earlier than the app because Aaron is producing it right now. But I just I don't know what that schedule looks like as far as uh, when that content's going to be going live. Sure, no problem. And okay. then, oh, Eric, you said oh, Yeah, I was just going to say, if, if we could just, you know, shout out to Kovnik Joe if he was still around. The Orgoth <laughs> wouldn't, have, uh, wouldn't have made it as far as they did. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and Matt, what I, wanted, I also want to ask, the different timelines. Riot Quest was the story in which the Infernals won, so it's just all these heroes are fighting for treasures, looting, you know hitting each other, you know, fun, fun times. But now that we're going this direction, that the Orgoth are now invading, the, the Infernals lost, the Orgoth are now coming up, is it possible that we might see some of these Riot Quest characters, I guess, in in this timeline of Mark IV? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I guess possible gives me a, a, a weasel word there that I'm just going to embrace. Um, <laughs> Like, anything's possible. I don't necessarily know if there are direct plans to do that kind of thing with Mark IV, but we've we've only seen a few of 
of what some of those on army characters are going to be. I think um, Eilish was recently just teased. Oh, oh my gosh. new I sculpt him. is yeah. That new sculpt is 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 badass. It's it's a sick yeah. sculpt. I love it. Um, but it's funny too because you've seen like he used to be this clean cut almost dapper looking no guy. rugged and, men absolutely. rugged men with hair on their face yeah, num, num, the num, num, num. i'm like yep yeah. and apparently he found himself like a little baby egregore somewhere along the, on the way so we'll, we'll see what happens with that all right eric i think you should go ahead and ask these two questions because this is all you now so i'm gonna take a second okay <laughs> um so matt what has happened to the grimkin after the infernal invasion well they didn't go away we know that yes. um we've we've done some rpg stuff at involves the Grimkin kind of attacking a corrupt individual in Lael and a pastiche of the cask of Amontillado that has a, a cask imp in it. So that, that was always one of the perils that the old witch knew she'd have to face eventually when she released the Grimkin. They were a stopgap that allowed her to kind of force the Infernal's hand, but she can't really contain them. They're this chaotic force that follows its own instinct and its own uh, predatory behavior and once they're out in the world they're out in the world and you know they might proceed into the shadows now that so many people have died and there isn't as much wickedness in the world but wherever the wicked are the grimkin will go and find them so you, know, you might still have haunted villages not by spirits but by you know imps and strange stories that parents are telling their children you know revitalizing those cautionary tales that became the fairy tales the folklore mm -hmm. you know the grimkin are absolutely still out there and still wrecking havoc on the the kinds of people that they they tend to torment neat well <laughs> no uh yeah no complaining there yeah because isn't like the heretic hanging out in his old stomping grounds and yeah, in, uh, protector land yeah. yeah 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 did you hear that andy it's my house now get out Okay, oh, gosh, I, this question. <laughs> Go ahead, Erica. Okay, so Matt, this question is probably the single most important, deepest question we can ask you on this interview this evening. Many minds want to know. Uh, the thought of asking you this question has my uh, has my heart racing, even sweating a little bit. Uh, and it's a three part. It's a three part question. Yeah. Uh, are you ready to receive, sir? Yes. Okay, Matt, are there dinosaurs in zoo? If yes, can we expect zealots riding dinos? If no, are there plans to incorporate dinosaurs or creatures like them to the Iron Kingdoms? Please say yes. <laughs> so I'm going to answer your question with a little story. Uh, when news first came out about New Ichthyr and about Tristan, you know, leading a colony of people there, there was some conversation on the, I think it was the RPG Discord, or it might have been the War Machine General Discord. I don't remember which now. But people were asking about Tristan on a T-Rex. <laughs> so as soon as that happened, I went and I found... So I'm a kid of the 80s and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. poured like all the fancy, super exclusive toys. But I would go and I would just, you know, fawn over them in the toy stores. And there was one line called Dino Riders. Do you remember Dino Riders? Mm-hmm. Dude, I okay. like, I love dinosaurs. Like that was my jam as a kid. I wanted to be a paleontologist. I had like... The coolest okay. Christmas was when I got all the Jurassic Park stuff. Like, okay. I really like Jurassic dinosaurs. Park. Yes, I, I, mean, I really like dinosaurs. Dinotopia books. I, I was right. Yes, there. yes, yes, yes. So there was a an iconic in a rider. It was one of the, I think it was one of the evil ones because it had the brain box on it. But it was a big T-Rex with like lasers on the side of its face <laughs> and technological armor. So when people started talking about you know, Zoo and Tristan and the T-Rexes and stuff like that, I found the image of that Dino Riders T-Rex, and I photoshopped Tristan 2 riding on its back oh my God. as my response to this line of conversation and query. So while I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of dinosaurs in Zoo, I want you to know my heart is with you. <laughs> okay, cool. Because um, that, is, that is a good investment, sir. Privateer Press. Like, dinosaurs is, is hot right now. It's very hot. I mean, they've, they've been hot forever especially <laughs> fair the, that is that is true true I'm, statement i mean they would make so, a really good 80 millimeter base it's right <laughs> and look the the orgoth have clearly been trucking around somewhere where they're dinosaur-like creatures look at their cavalry mm -hmm. that's what i was thinking i was just like 
direction is my game going to right now because I really <laughs> like it. <laughs> and I, I mean, we know that Zoo has jungles and like going back to the original King Kong from the 30s, you know, you, you have a big enough jungle, you're going to have some Carnadons in there. Yeah, Matt, look, I am down to clown. Like, if you have dinos, I am, I'm like 100% like, sold. You know who loves dinosaurs possibly even more than the both of us put together? Who? Aaron Rudell. Oh, Aaron really? Rudell loves dinosaurs. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a pretty nice hadrosaur. Oh, that's not a hadrosaur. That's a parasaurolophus. Aaron, you know <laughs> what you must do. The ball is in your court. <laughs> it, it, if any of us can, it would be him. It becomes canon, uh, then. Dinos yeah. Dinosaurs of the people. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Have I adequately answered the most important tripartite question of this interview? Yes, I am, I am satisfied with the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> All right. Uh, I actually wanted it just just to add, uh, okay. So uh, with the infernals, because we kind of meant we t touched on Grimkin, you know what's happening with them. Matt, are we able to do like a, a Spitfire round of like how? The, okay, it's weird because we're the, how the game goes is that they don't want to call them factions. It's because it's the armies, and then you know the faction has the two armies. I I I, we're, I just want to use factions or nations, however you want to go and hit it. Are we able to do like a Spitfire of saying like like after? post claiming what's happened to signar what's happened to kate or uh, protectorate because uh, i mean a lot of us i think have followed the hench hold scrolls but i think some of us may you know be a little you know twitter unaware or or, or having a hard time i don't do twitter so this is beneficial for people like me <laughs> <laughs> sure, absolutely yeah yeah absolutely so starting with signar we know that signar has recovered possibly the best out of the human nations uh, even so they're not in like a 100 percent perfect place because while well, they've got new technologies and they've been advancing the ones they already have they have this brand new army in the storm legion there's also a plague in the in the midlands that's starting to spread a little bit equivalent to like the antonine plague that ravaged the roman empire um, there's still some cultural friction and people are going to end up you know relying on their good graces here in the very near future when the orgoth come back you're gonna possibly see a lot of refugees trying to flee that advance being dispersed out once again like happened during the invasion of lale so they are in a good place but facing some challenges the protectorate is as we all know a a ghost of its former self. There's a massive religious schism, and a large number of the population either went through the Celestial Gate at Hengehold to the Cirrus Galaxy, or followed an exodus of their people south along the Continental Corridor uh, with Tristan. So you have these massive protectorate cities that have, you know, like a fifth of their former population between the War with the Scorn and the Infernal Invasion and sort of the other cultural shifts that have happened there. You still have remnants of the priesthood trying to maintain as best they can, but a lot of the protectorate has become, I'm, I'm not going to call it a ghost town, but uh, vastly underpopulated compared to what it was. Uh, I actually use that for the uh, Gen Con adventure Menos Fury Road as a justification of why the protectorate would be reaching out for outsiders to help with uh, some of the challenges that they face. Uh, Kador is also in a precarious position right now. They suffered pretty greatly due to infernalists, highly stationed infernalists in their ruling class and within the Grey Lords in particular. They didn't have as much opportunity to recover themselves after the claiming as other places did, like Signar. So when the Orgoth landed on their shores, they were already on the back foot. And because of that, you know, they're a little bit more rough around the edges. They're a little bit more ragged. They don't have the same force of arcanists that they used to, but they have demonstrated and are continuing to demonstrate kind of the the iron resolve that the people of the North have been known for. Uh, that you know, never surrender attitude as they put up as best a fight as anybody really could against the invading Morgoth. You have nations like Ord and Lael, which are I'd say somewhere on that spectrum between Signar's prosperity and Cador's uh, grim fate at the moment, mm -hmm. where they've they've certainly made certain gains. The 
uh, Lely's in particular, now have a unified nation under one of their actual royal leaders. But even there, they're not flourishing as much as some of the other kingdoms do for, for reasons that will become evident in the near future. Ord is definitely reconsolidating itself and strengthening its military through the Crucible Guard and their technologies very likely is going to be a powerful blockade against the Orgoth when they come south from Kaor. But uh, Ord has always had its troubles with like the division between the the Tortoran Castellans and the, the Thurian nobility. Uh, it's interesting because like in the drawing of the map of the Iron Kingdoms, they took several different cultures and just kind of threw a big circle around them and said, All right, you guys are all Ordic now despite there being you know, significant cultural differences between them. So you're always going to have a little bit of that internal friction there. And it's not an Iron Kingdom, but Crix is expanding. Uh, like we talk about in Nightmare Empire, it sees Zoo as the future. And as do people, I, you know, as do I. <laughs> because of the T-Rexes, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, where the T-Rexes are, that, that way lies the future. And because of that, Scar Ravenmane has really started extending the reach of the Dragonfather's Talons to the south, going along the Continental Corridor, where she preys on trade vessels that move back and forth between the two continents, where she creeps ever closer to the shores mm -hmm. of Zoo month after month, establishing her uh, her way stations, uh, supply points, and pirate havens along the corridor. Uh, really letting the Zooies get their first taste of Crixian menace is going to be an interesting thing, uh, if, if not in the war game, then definitely in the RPG. Mm-hmm. Cool. I think that was all of them at that point, wasn't it? I mean, we could talk a little bit about rule, but Borderlands and Beyond kind of let you know where they are. They're a cosmopolitan society that's built up its uh, its position in the world by taking in the desperate from all sorts of different civilizations and allowing the breadth of their knowledge and cultural diversity allow them to become really a rival for the greatest of the Iron Kingdom. Gotcha. And then there was a really interesting question that somebody put up on the Dusk, sorry, on like the Ret Dusk Facebook page. And and I thought it was interesting because the Retribution, their whole shtick was that humans were killing their gods by the use of magic. But after reading through the Henchhold Scrolls, Ilara is the one who ended up killing the, the gods, right? So right. I guess... Do they, I remember the person said, do they see her as like the enemy or like a messiah because of like progressing retribution? Or I guess Ios, like this step forward. Is it a step forward? I don't know. I think that the opinions of Alara and her actions are probably not uh, uniform across the entirety of what remains of Ios because it was certainly a controversial action. And it had some cosmologically uh, devastating effects on the people of Ios. So I could see some who view her absolutely as the great enemy. But simultaneously, there are those who, like the, the cult of Nero did in the past, there are very likely eldritch who embrace their new condition. Probably not the majority of them, but there are some who might revel in the power and instead view her as something of a savior in a weird way. So... Uh, I, I guess both both is good <laughs> no 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 problem i just I, I i when somebody ended up like posting i wish i put i had the person's name on there but i was just like that's actually really interesting because yeah like the the overall goal was like we have to save our gods and that ended up not being the case so how do we view her at that point so that, that's neat what about convergence because what what has happened to convergence are there any like conversions that are still in Amarin, or did all of them go through the portal? No, not all of them went through. No, um, a, a number of pretty significant inv individuals did. That's for sure. But um, the convergence right during the claiming, uh, there have always been different opinions within the leadership uh, of the convergence of Cirrus, and you saw how those differences really caused a, a fracture in the cult. So I think. Of the Convergence members that didn't go through, I'm thinking of like uh, Forge Master, Synthurion, and probably Orion, um, they might 
have tried to return to the status quo where you have um, others, uh, particularly the younger uh, Aurora and that kind of thing, who uh, might have gone off with sort of a revised coda of religion, you know, using the knowledge of it's not just a single wandering celestial body. Uh, there's something greater beyond that our people have gone to. Uh, you might actually see kind of uh, a resurgence, or not a resurgence, but an increase in people who turn to Cirrus worship because it was a very real rescue that happened there during the infernal attack. Uh, and we know that Cirrus of all stripes are being more openly welcomed in places like Signar, where they're incorporated and the particular like aspects of the religion that lead them toward uh, science and mathematics and, and study help to advance the technolo technology of those nations. Um, so I, I guess the short answer to the question is, there is still a convergence of Cirrus on Cain. Um, there's actually probably more than one that have minor ideological differences. And some of them might even be walking the streets as members of society. I, I'm looking at the questions. I don't think there's anything really left because you, you hit the other ones. Unless, mm -hmm. Erica, did you have anything you wanted to ask? Uh, not. I mean, the dinosaurs, that was like pretty up there for me. Um, it was up there for me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty high. Um, no, I think I'm good. Okay, but Unless like, there's anything else Matt wanted to talk yeah, about. Yeah, Matt, did you have anything you wanted to share? Um, honestly, I'm, I was hoping to ask Erica about her Shadow of the Seeker campaign. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to know if there was like a really standout moment for you so far oh um i'm trying to think because like like i said i really like the little like the little charming bits that are that are sprinkled in there i, I appreciate super appreciate i'm trying to think i uh one of the things i really enjoyed again i'm only in chapter one so one of the starting quests right when the party has to go and retrieve daro's shipment from down river i was like because two of our party members are experts in poisons. Sorry, spoilers. They're expert in poisons. So when the party elected to return the bottles back to Daro, I was <laughs> that uh, that led to a uh, to funny times. So yeah, like the the party in, in, invertedly like poisoned the the town. But no. yeah, <laughs> um, and they keep the baby bear. That's what I yes. Like. That that's the one redeeming good thing the party did was save the bear. <laughs> like. <laughs> So good job, Delaware War Machine. Uh, you guys are stark role models in the yearless community. So <laughs> the people, thank you. <laughs> Bards will sing of your tales. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I mean, again, we're, we're, we're getting through. We're, um, my goal is four sessions per chapter. So looking to wrap it up between like ooh, 15 and 20, depending on how long they get. Scheduling this fall is going to get really weird. Because we have a ton of conventions coming up, work for me is always, you know, that can be a random, beautiful mess sometimes. But uh, yeah, so we're doing like an every other week thing because we still got to get our war machines, you know, in there and the in between. But yeah, man, it's it, it, solid story so far. I'm enjoying. And if you have any recommendations for the, you know, our next campaign story, I'm all, I'm all ears. Yeah. Well, like I said early on, if you want to shift gears and go pirating for a while, the, uh, Tales from the Blackwater Cantina has a lot of options in it for some some interesting stuff. If you haven't already picked it up, Escape the Mind Slavers. Mm -mm, was... I have that one. So that's a pretty fun one that takes place in rule. So you're not oh, too okay. far away. Yeah, yeah. Um, you'll probably have to scale up the threats a little bit because you're. Oh, I already have to do left. that. The part we did the fort, and they just like arbitrarily, you know, did the fort, and I'm like, okay, yeah, no, we gotta <laughs> we gotta adjust some stuff. <laughs> Yeah, Can't be hitting twenty sevens all the time there, um, chaos the assassin person. If you're listening, you know you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, Escape the Mind Slavers might be a fun version. Um, I'm hoping to get out some some more shorter adventures as well. Things in like that thirty two to forty eight page range instead of mm -hmm. the you know, one hundred and forty four pages or whatever. Yeah, I. Yeah, but the way like the way that um, because I've I've have a couple of small you know campaigns like D and D. I have you know the old the old Witchfire books, and then I have this and the new Witchfire book. Um, the way it's it's broken up, it's not um intimidating for me as a you know as a, as a DM. Like it's very easy to digest and transpose into the actual um into actual gameplay so yeah. for anyone that's listening that might not know or like let's just say you play D D and you're looking at maybe jumping into this world the material is very 
it, it flows well and it's easy to pick up even for, you know, if you have a full-time job or whatever and you're trying to prep your nights and stuff, it, it, it hasn't been an issue thus far. I don't know if it gets more complicated later on in the story, Matt, but chapter <laughs> one, chapter one is, uh, is A-OK. Well, one of my goals with chapter one was to have it almost be its own sort of standalone adventure that led into the rest of the story mm -hmm. so that um, like if we wanted to pull that content and run uh, the yearless child at a convention or something we'd have to you know pare it down a little bit to mm -hmm. fit the window mm -hmm. but definitely wanted to give people kind of a, a full experience with just that one chapter and then just add more on to it yeah that'd be good I, i'm actually i bought ticket to your uh andy and i we bought tickets to we'll be at warfare weekend so i think we're doing a a, a session with you at on one of the days at one o'clock so we were able to awesome. get a spot in there so yeah i'll be joining you table side and see what you got matt right. hopefully hopefully enough it's going to be great to see the for both of you face to face. Yeah, we're super excited. Um, after this, after uh, we're done this interview, I'll send you uh, pictures that I took last night of our map, our beautifully drawn camp and dungeon, uh, so you can see where we are in your story. <laughs> okay, I'm looking forward to it. And I think with that, I think that's going to go and get us to the end of this episode. Matt, I mean, do you have any closing remarks that you wanted to go ahead and share or anything we should keep our eye out for for Iron Kingdom's RPG? Um, at the moment, we're wrapping up Nightmare Empire and getting it off the printers so that we can get books in backers' hands. For people who are interested in purchasing PDFs or books of some of the previous releases, I believe those are going to be going live on the store soon. Like, ideally before the end of the month, but that's a little up in the air right now. But other than that, like, we're, we're always producing stuff for the uh, Iron Kingdom's Requiem setting, and you can check out the, the website and see what we have in store for you. I'm really excited to, to see what ends up coming down the pipeline and being able to see that Nightmare Empire's book when it gets off the presses. Uh, Eric, did you yeah. have anything? Yeah, um, just to mention, I think that's the one book that our group is kind of chomping at the bit for. Everybody keeps uh, is is the Nightmare Empires. That is um, that is the one that is talked about. Well, in our current campaign, but yeah, pe uh, people are really excited for that one. Closing remarks, Matt. Thanks again for coming on. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for the uh, the great news. I'm just I'm happy, and I'm getting ready to break into my Cador box that just came in the mail, my Winter Core. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited to welcome the the new miniature babies to their to their new home <laughs> so they can go and conquest for mother. <laughs> all the great bears. Yeah, it's all, so only funny. bears, only bears on this train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but th thanks Matt. It's it's good to have you back. It's always fun to be on. Yeah, Matt, I wanted to thank you again for coming on to Tried and True. And with that, that's going to go ahead and get us to the end of this episode. Thanks for tuning in and figuring out what's going on in Imran right now. And I guess we'll catch you on the next episode. Take care, everybody. Bye.